Today's conversation is with Dr. Christine Meyer, an advocate for value-based care. This is in contrast to quantity-based care, which is currently an industry standard, where it matters how many blood tests and what else someone has done for you in order for them to justify their compensation. You can see how that alignment doesn't really work out. So it's a misalignment of incentive for that industry and its professionals. And Dr. Christine Meyer is actually looking to push for value-based care. Anyone in business knows that the most effective way to get things done is to focus on the results. What happened as a result of our effort? And simply, that's not how it's going right now in wellness and care, in particular with primary care doctors, which is where Dr. Christine Meyer believes the future is. So without further ado, Dr. Christine Meyer. Christine, interesting enough, uh, healthcare in America in particular, as it's done by businesses, is like, give or take, the stories I've heard throughout the years is that a lot of people just do it on autopilot, boilerplate, right? Then you've got healthcare itself with its own set of problems and it's a massive Mm -hmm. industry, right? And somewhere in the middle of all that, What you're doing with value-based care is a mission in and of itself. Now, can you sort of just break down, if you had to, what value-based care is in contrast to other forms of care? Sure. So value-based care basically refers to a payment model uh, that primarily affects primary care doctors, but it's an alternative payment model. So Before, we were paid based on how much we did to patients, you know, how many procedures, how many tests, how many visits. Uh, So it was very much a reimbursement by quantity. Uh, Value-based care is a model that really bases our reimbursement on quality of care. So how well we care for our patient population, how are we managing their chronic diseases, are they getting screened for their preventable illnesses like cancers? Are they getting their immunizations? Are, do they have access to us? So by reimbursing doctors via this value-based care model, we really promote the idea that it's not about how much we do to patients, but how well we care for them, which, duh, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, I see. And so there was this quantity-based care, essentially, Mm -hmm, is what we were looking at prior. And Mm -hmm. now you're looking to help push people towards value-based care, which begs the question, why hasn't it always been this way, right? The incentives are clearly way misaligned. Uh, And it's just like in business, right? It's like, if I can just prove to you that I did a bunch of things for you, as opposed to telling you what those things actually did for you, that makes all the difference in keeping someone around, right? Exactly, exactly. I have no idea why it took us so long to get here. <laughs> and and honestly, we're not even there yet. There's still a lot of pushback uh, when it comes to value-based care. I think it has to do with, just like you said, aligning those uh, those incentives and those values, not just in primary care, but across all of the stakeholders in medicine. So physicians, other healthcare providers, patients, payers, insurers, it's really complicated. And, you know, inertia is a beast. So we just have to try to overcome that. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of uh, walled gardens inside of healthcare that yes. seem really odd in, in the way that they're placed. Uh, let's not even get started with the people in the middle who are who are <laughs> controlling, you know, how payments are, because that's also another thing, right, is like uh, third parties that are involved and how that impacts someone who has worked their butt off to get into this position to be able to help people and prove that they know what they're doing, that they know what they're talking about to help people. And they can't even spend more than a minute with someone, right? So, exactly. so then you have exactly. this other aspect of, if, if uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, where like you want to provide value-based care, but you have to keep moving as well because uh, depending on people's insurances, it's a whole thing now. Is that accurate? Right. <laughs> yeah. So we really do have, uh, we have one foot on either side of the fence right now. Um, and that's such a good point. Uh, so like in my practice, I would say, you know, 40% of our patients are in some sort of value-based 
contract and 60% are still in what we call a fee-for-service contract. But for us as a practice, what we have decided to do is just approach every patient, regardless of their payer, as if they're in a value-based care contract, because that is better care. So, you know, we're spending more time with patients. Um, we are churning through patients at a at just much, much less in terms of quantity of visits, but the visit itself is so rich. We talk about so much. And by becoming sort of agnostic to the, the patient's payer, we've elevated the quality of care our entire patient population receives. And that's the goal. You know, if we can just insert value-based care models into primary care, it, it's like popcorn. Eventually, every kernel pops and everybody's better for it. I love this because it's implying innovation. Right in a in a space that it that simply uh, doesn't move the same way other industries or verticals do for any number of reasons. Right, there's a lot of red tape. And how right. has that been for you trying to push for this kind of innovation and for going against what is a standard practice of uh, you know read them and weep, keep them moving. And you're like, okay, right. well, let's take a second here to talk to you, really get to know you, what's going on, because as primary care doctor, you should know as much as possible about each one of your patients, but then uh, you need to know them. And if you have a lot of patients, how can you do that? Similar to a CEO that uh, starts off with a startup and now they have a hundred plus employees and they just simply can't know every single employee that well. Is this sort of a challenge that you've come across? Yeah, it definitely is. But our, our answer to that is to very carefully and strategically reinvest our incentive dollars into increasing access to our patients. So we do have a lot of patients. There's a shortage of primary care doctors in my area, honestly, in every area. So what we've done is create opportunities for patients to come to our office when they want to be seen. So we have evening hours, we have Saturday hours, we have Sunday hours. So even though we are spending more time with each patient. We have spread those visits out over, you know, non-bankers hours because guess what? You know, patients have jobs and families and they can't always go to the doctor between nine and five Monday through Friday. So um, that's been a challenge. You know, people don't like to work on the weekends and at, and at night, but again, by aligning the incentives across all of the stakeholders in my practice and in primary care in general, Everybody buys in. You just see the benefit to the patients and to our quality of life. It's, it, it's much better to spend 20, 25, 30 minutes with a patient than to spend 10. It makes me feel better about the work that I do every day. So what seems to be the biggest obstacle in having mass adoption of value-based care, in your opinion, of course? I mean, it, it goes, it, it's so deep. I mean, first of all, there's a there's a lack of understanding. And I think when we don't understand something, we tend to fear it. Um, so part of my mission is to just get the word out there that value-based care is not a bad thing. You know, the word value implies cheapness or lack of quality. So I almost hate that term, but yeah. I think we need to overcome this uh, preconceived idea that it's, it's, not good. There, people are going to get less care, which means, you know, cheaper care. It's really not that at all. So overcoming some of the uh, lack of knowledge about it, I think, is really important. And the other thing, of course, is is Washington. There are just there are some archaic payment models in Washington. I've been there since the beginning of time. That you know, even just the most recent. Um, bill that passed is still underpaying and undervaluing primary care doctors, even though we've been fighting this fight for years and years and years. So, you know, I, I look at it more as a grassroots effort, you know, take it one primary care doctor at a time, one patient at a time, one community at a time. And eventually, you know, our voices together will reach the legislators and the powers that be that, that create these laws that determine how we are reimbursed and hopefully change will happen. But it really does. It starts out in the teeny tiniest of weeds. Yeah, there's so many parallels to business uh, in particular, let's say for like freelancers. Uh, they often take on projects where they create like billable hours and then 
all your work is like at- attached to this dynamic between you and your client of like, how many hours did I put into this? What else can I put into this? And that's totally, again, misaligned as opposed to going, okay, um, we finished this portion of our project so far. Let's review how this is working. You can immediately start to see like the diagnosis taking place, which is probably what you want someone focused on your health to be doing. And to then have that case study or that use case and being able to Mm -hmm. present it to sort of show the body of work and the uh, effectiveness of the care. And that ultimately what should be, if I had to choose between someone who has done 100,000 hours, but there's no clear rhyme Nothing reason to show with for the, it. Yeah, right. As opposed to someone who did a lot and even just say 30 minutes, like <laughs> the, right. the answer is very clear. And I, yeah, there's definitely something fascinating about that. I mean, that's the kind word of saying it. It's ironic that, you'd have to go into lobbying to likely have the mass adoption that you're looking for to work against those who are lobbying to keep the archaic systems in place. And so now it turns into, you not only have to be a professional uh, person who is looking at someone uh, for their health and their well-being, but then you also have to have an entire army uh, ready to go and lobby and convince, and as if you needed to convince someone that the people you want taking care of you have a pedigree, uh, right? right? This is like it's it's crazy. Yeah, I've spent a good bit of time on Capitol Hill actually doing advocacy work, and it you know. It's so surprising how little our legislators actually know about healthcare. Like I would think every every one of us has been a patient <laughs> at some point and has interacted with, you know, a healthcare provider at some point. But when it comes to people actually making decisions down there, it's like, you know, so it's a grind for sure, but it's also really rewarding because I can see cracks in the armor. I can see movement forward. Um especially if we can get in front of the right people just enough times, it's like wearing them down with use cases, just story after story about how patients who are cared for in these models just do better. The data is not questionable. We just got to get it in front of the right people. Yeah. And have you looked into or explored what (laughs) companies, there are companies out there that are sort of focused on creating employer backed uh, uh, care plans or benefit plans, because not only is it more affordable to the person uh, working at that company, but also to the employers, instead of this boilerplate, go with the traditional, the people who've always been there who are likely keeping the archaic rules in place, right? And then knowing that that's more affordable, you have a patient who's likely showing up at your practice in way better mood, <laughs> you know, not mm-hmm. as concerned. And it probably helps your own work to know that it's not an arm and a leg, but you can still get compensated for it. Or, or is, am I wrong? Because I, I don't know for sure. And do those kinds of plans actually work against what you're trying to do with creating a, an established uh, principle for value-based care? No, I mean, I think a lot of companies are just recognizing that their benefits package has to revolve more around wellness, right? So, you know, uh, a company that offers their employees incentives for going to get their physical, that's been happening for a really long time, but that's basically value-based care. It's like, Go get your physical because if you are, you know, getting checked out before something happens, you're going to be healthier in the long run. And, you know, as an aside, that'll cost us less money. Nobody says that part out loud, but it it really is that. Or the same thing when companies offer plans that cover gym memberships or exercise programs. It's, It's that. It's promoting the wellness, prevention, quality of care over you know, go visit your doctor four times this year uh, because, you know, somehow that's going to make you healthier. We obviously know that that doesn't work. Yeah. And and, and this comes right back to what you're saying about value-based care is knowing that your patient does have that gym membership that is eating those healthier foods more often than not. And no one's mm-hmm. going to sit there and go complete. I mean, there are extremes, right? But <laughs> everyone has right. a cookie, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, life's too short for for us not to indulge. Um, yeah, all of that comes together, like you said, in this wellness. Um, and 
Unfortunately, there's also this uh, connotation, just like with value based, right? Which really just means results based. But then there's right, also this exactly. connotation with wellness of mm-hmm. being woo woo when it's not. There's nothing magical or mystical about taking care of yourself, right? No. Do you run into that a lot? Yes. <laughs> and honestly, I think we are guilty, like my colleagues and I. So I, I grew up in the generation of medicine where that is exactly what it was. You know, what we did was we saw a patient, ordered a test made a diagnosis and prescribed a medicine. That was the cadence always, right? If we veered away from that and said, hey, you know, you might not need a diabetes pill, but you sure could lose, you know, 25 pounds and be like, oh, you know, but but that is exactly what it's about. I think that the best care, honestly, is often the least care, the less we do to patients and the more we act as coaches and advisors and really looking outside of, you know, what can we, you know, prescribe, what procedure can we do, what tests can we order, um, and focusing more on that lifestyle piece. And, you know, again, the relationship piece. If I tell someone you need to lose 20 pounds and then I disappear off the face of the earth for the next year (laughs) and they come back to me a year later and they haven't lost 20 pounds, it's like, you know, that's not their fault. You know, I I need to have this relationship with them so I can coach them through these very things that are going to, in the end, impact their wellness the most. 100%. It mm-hmm. hits different when you have a relationship with someone who you know you can trust. You know they're not just doing whatever their job is. They genuinely care about your well-being, right? If your family tells you, you know, you might want to cut back on the cheeseburgers, you're like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> yeah. right? Or you guys don't know. Um, right. But when a medical professional you've been seeing who has proven that they care about you and has shown you results as you continue to work together and they say, hey, look, the next step of things is great. We got everything else under control, but you're going to have to cut back on the cheeseburgers. It just lands different, right? That dynamic, that human, that soft skill, that human connection, that is going to be super important, especially moving forward. Have you taken a look at how these large language models with AI are going to be influencing uh, either for the better or for the worse value-based care? Yeah, I mean, I there's also this feeling among doctors, I think, and healthcare professionals in general that AI is going to, you know, take over. Doctors are going to be obsolete, but that's not going to happen. I think, you know, I think AI is going to be a tremendous tool for us in medicine in general, but in value-based care. You know, we all complain about having to spend so much time doing the other stuff, you know, not caring for the patient, not having the face-to-face time with the patient, but filling out the papers and submitting the reports and getting the, the medicine prior authorized and all this stuff. You know, when we, when we leverage tools like AI to take away the stuff that we are not trained to do and shouldn't be spending our time doing, it just frees us up for more of that human, you know, the op opposite of artificial um, interactions with our patients. I think it's going to be tremendous. I, but I but I do think it also, you know, there's a line that's walked and there's a little bit of danger there. Like I just saw an article about care pods, you know, where there's going to be these, you know, pods popping up in malls where people could just walk in and get instant access to uh, to AI and get their disease diagnosed or whatever. Um, Um, (laughs) That's That's like WebMD, like people who do Google searches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Exactly. But I think people, you know, there's a little bit of danger with this avatar and, you know, people who may perceive this as being realer than it is just real enough to be dangerous. You know, most people have the sense when they're Googling and reading an article, they're like, oh, I should maybe take this with a grain of salt. But you have a very realistic face in front of you telling you, you know, this is what I think you have going on. I think it's a lot easier to buy into that. Um, So there's tremendous opportunity. And of course, there's danger. I think we, you know, doctors especially cannot run away from AI and, you know, throw a temper tantrum and act like this is just evil. I think we need to embrace it for the potential tools that it'll bring to us. I think it's going to be phenomenal when it's good. Right. It it sort of 
doctors should be the first ones adopting it to rule out and test out and explore and know everything about it so that they can help set the precedent for how it's going to work. It's like any subject matter expert who's tried using these tools automatically can see that it may generate some information that isn't necessarily good, but you can parse Mm -hmm. out that and still look at what it did do that was great work, but only a subject matter expert can do that. If you went to uh, one of these models right now and asked it to write you a whole app and you know it tells you why it's doing that with these sections. If you've never coded or programmed anything, you're looking at that like, what am I looking at, right? A you're lot, right. it's the same way. If it told you the pathology of something and why you should consider this and you've never studied pathology for medicine, you're like, okay, sounds great, right? Or chemistry yeah. for, for right. certain things. It's not going to make any sense to you, right? And Right. Maybe with time, over time, that'll change. But I truly wholeheartedly agree with you that uh, there are going to be people who are, are going to see this as a double-edged sword. But knowing that you get to choose which edge is going to be the one that will <laughs> be cutting across if you as an individual professional in your own vertical become an advocate and start exploring that technology and get ahead of it, right? Because it, it, it will make things faster. I totally agree with you. If, yeah, we better, we have to get involved. Right. Period. How much, how much, how many to. hours would you say is spent on all the others to all the other time uh, yeah. for doing all the other work other than the work you want to be doing with patients? Yeah. I, I mean, I honestly think we spend 50% of our time doing non patient facing wow. stuff. Wow. It's a lot. It's a lot. And, and that's a huge reason why we have a shortage of doctors. Like doctors just don't want to invest that kind of money, go into that level of debt, and then spend half their life doing paperwork. That's not, you know, not <laughs> what I signed up for. Yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think that's the last time I checked. Paperwork was not on the agenda. Saving lives, mm-hmm. totally. <laughs> yeah, ideally, right, right. Uh, okay, so, so then let's lay it out. It, it, you have people's attention. They can clearly see the benefit here. The case has been made, right? What are some things that people who are listening, uh, regardless of their profession, can do to help encourage uh, this manifesting into just everyday life? I think, you know, like many industries, it really does start with the consumer and the consumer demand, right? So our consumer is the patient. I think patients need to become educated in what a value-based care model is and what it means when their doctor is participating in a value-based care model because they have to be bought into. It's a partnership. So, you know, I can't advocate for my patients to go get their colorectal cancer screening and consider myself succeeding in value-based care if they don't actually go do that. So, you know, we have a, a contractual obligation to all participate to make this work. Um, the other huge piece of it from a consumer standpoint is utilization. You know, how our consumers utilize healthcare resources and There's just so much waste and misuse. And it's not necessarily a patient's fault. I think there's a lack of understanding. Like we'll have patients say like, oh, my hand hurt on Sunday morning. So I went to the emergency room. That's not what the emergency room is intended to treat. But what are they supposed to do? So if I'm not available on Saturday morning as their doctor and they don't have an urgent care around, around the corner, They're going to do what they need to do. So if part of it is on us to increase our access and also to educate on our patients on how to most appropriately utilize our very limited healthcare resources. Um, So definitely consumer engagement, consumer education is critical. You know, we need to put ourselves out there. Patients need to be uh, participants in their healthcare and, you know, also demand from their payers different models, you know, and you can do that. Like patients don't know that you can go to your health insurer or your employer and say, why aren't you covering this? This is ridiculous. And sort of be a voice for what they really need and want. Yeah, no, that's big. That is true. I myself have recently been uh, to the ER a few times and I've seen some real emergencies in there. And then the other time there were some people who just want to stay out of the cold who don't have a home. Right. right? And, you know, exactly. that's there. There's that. Right. And then there are genuinely people who, for whatever reason, you you just see that they're not, it's not an emergency. Right. But instead of going right. to an urgent care, which uh, at least on my side of town, there's plenty of them. Uh, yeah. 
I don't know. Some people just, everything is an emergency. And here's the biggest thing, right? Uh, taxes, uh, the DMV, understanding how healthcare truly works. None of that is taught in, no. uh, in public education uh, in the, at the general level before you go out into society as an adult at all. And those right. are the biggest things you face. You're right. You're right. I, un- unless you're in a profession where algebraic equations and calculus is a thing, <laughs> you rarely face that as an adult, nope. right? Yeah, uh, no one ever asked you to 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 play a Shakespeare role <laughs> at, on an <laughs> average Saturday night, right? Uh, no one's right. asking you why uh, there was the you know the Trail of Tears or, or this, even though those are all historical things and important to know. Those yeah. aren't the things we face, and yet those are the very things that we are least prepared for, and the things we face most constant as we grow and live in society. And it's not a part of our education. It's a truly, truly peculiar, curious circumstance we find ourselves in. And then that's why we end up in situations like this where people are using the wrong level of care for yeah. their for their experiences. Would, would you say that's accurate? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm always really surprised at how little patients understand their own healthcare plan. You know, there's this idea, and we hear this all the time, but I have I have excellent insurance. <laughs> you do, but that doesn't mean they cover everything under any circumstance. And, you know, that's there's so many layers in the fault there, but it does come down to, you know, we don't teach that. Employers don't necessarily teach their employees what the plan is going to be that they're offered. Patients don't dig into it. Like a lot of people choose a plan based purely on cost and don't realize that, yeah, you're paying less for this plan, but when you actually need it, it probably is going to cover less. So, you know, people don't understand their healthcare plan. They don't understand how the system works. And it's all on us that maybe do understand a little bit better to try to get the word out there and educate people. Absolutely. I mean, I had to learn on my own. I don't even know when it was expected to know this, but at some point I realized I have to know the difference between HMO, PPO, and then there are even differences between those plans. Oh, yeah. You know, and uh, realizing that I can only be in one network when I'm in HMO, and then with PPO, you could potentially see more people. It's also generally more expensive. The list expensive. goes on. Exactly. At, at what point was I supposed to know that? Until I got sick? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Which is most exactly. people's first experience with that. Unless they're parents when they need or what it. have you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, <laughs> it's, right. Uh, it's truly uh, fascinating. And, uh, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation, that it's being recorded, and that uh, we can continue to push that discussion uh, because it it does needs that's what it needs it needs conversation it needs discussion it needs awareness and it needs yeah. people to know a call to action and the call to actions you were talking about is uh, people should if I if I remember correctly people should start looking into what the proper level of care is for what they may be experiencing right mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, exactly. and, and the other is actually asking for that wherever possible for it to be value-based care from their employer. You're getting involved as much as possible because right now it's going to take consumer demand more than anything. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Right on. All right. So uh, with that said, uh, other than that, since people are listening, is there anywhere in particular you want them to go visit a website or something of that nature? Yeah. So I have a website called CMMD Consulting. My role is really just to promote value-based care and to educate doctors who may be struggling in value-based care and how to succeed, how to make this model work for them and more importantly for their patients. So it's uh, cmmdconsulting.com. And uh, I I am happy to talk to anybody, share my knowledge. Uh, You know, I'm super passionate about it. And I think that's the only way we're going to get these models uh, moved forward is to keep talking about it. Right on. Christina, I can't thank you enough for stopping by. Uh, Definitely in education. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.